So we're going to read uh, 1 John 2, 18 through 27. Uh, just a couple things to remind you of today. Uh, G- uh, John was one of the 12 disciples. He was one of Jesus' closest friends. Uh, he's a pastor in the early church, and he's writing a pastoral letter to uh, some churches in Asia Minor. He's writing for three reasons, to give assurance of salvation, to push back against some false teachers, and to promote holy living in the church. That, that second reason to push back against false teachers is going to be key in our time together today. And so uh, let's go ahead and read it. And then we'll pray together, and then we'll talk about God's Word. And so, here's what the Apostle John says. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come, and therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all you have you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father, no one deny, who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, we come to you once again in our time, and God, we realize that, that this book, this, this word that you've given us, God, it's so important, and it has authority over our lives, God, and it, when we hear things in it, God, we should respond, and we should obey, and we should submit to it, God, we, we, we need you this morning, God. We are a, a sinful and a wicked people, God, a, apart from you. And so, God, we ask you through the Holy Spirit to just teach us these things this morning. Open our eyes and, and our hearts to receive what it is you have for us today, God. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers also, God. Lord, help me to be faithful to your word this morning. Help me to do what you've called me to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this section begins with John saying, Children. Have you ever had to say that to your kids? Children. (laughs) Hey kids, listen up. John is getting our attention. He uses two different words for children uh, in, um, in this book. One of them is technia, and it, it kind of refers to all of the, the church, but this word that he uses, um, it, it's pedia, and it's the word we get pediatrician for from. It, it literally means infants, babies. And it, and it means, he, he uses this word to imply that, that this church is, is spiritually immature in some ways. He, he's literally calling them babies. <laughs> babies, he's saying. So he says, children, 
It is the last hour. Children, it is the last hour. Has anybody ever heard the phrase, it is the last hour of time? Have you heard that phrase? Just stick your hand up. Uh, if, you, if you grew up in church like I did, you, you've heard this phrase a lot. It is the last hour of time. I've even heard preachers say it's the last minute of the last hour of time, right? Are you familiar with this terminology? Well, when I was young, I, I, it created a sense of urgency in my heart because I, I thought, well, if it's the last hour, I know how long an hour is, and so we must be really close to the end uh, of time. And the more you hear it, I think the more that our hearts get seared to it, that we get callous to the idea that we are in the last hour of time. And so uh, John here is not referring to a, a measurement of time, rather he's referring to this is the last season. This is the, this is the last season. And so the, the last hour refers fr- to the time between uh, Christ's first coming and his second coming. We live in this this season of time known as the last hour. But uh, even though John said 2,000 years ago it is the last hour, um, it should still create urgency in our heart today. We should realize that, that Jesus is in fact coming again. The, the, the last hour will end when Jesus returns Again, the Bible says that, that Jesus is coming and that no man knows the hour or, or, the, or the day that he will come. But I want us to just step back from all the busyness of the world and all the things that we have going on, maybe today or this week or, or in the future. And I want us to realize that we have a king who is coming. We have a king who is coming coming and on that day when Jesus comes none of those things that had consumed our hearts and consumed our minds will matter any longer we should live a different kind of life because we believe that our king is coming I can't give you an estimated time of arrival this morning, but I can tell you that Jesus is closer to coming today than he was yesterday, right? Are you with me this morning? I I can't give you a a day. I can't give you a year. I wouldn't even begin to try to, to tell you any of those things, but I do know that it's closer today than it was yesterday. Think for a moment, if you knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus would come tomorrow at 9.30 a.m., how would you live today? If you knew that he would be here tomorrow, at 9.30 a.m., how would you live today? What would you be concerned with today? Friend, he very well could be here tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. And so we as the body of Christ ought to live as if he's coming tomorrow. We need to leave behind the cares and the worries of this world. If it won't matter in 10,000 years from now, it won't matter. Right? (laughs) If, if, If we honestly believe that Jesus is coming soon, we ought to live our lives with urgency realizing that that he may come any second. And that's not to produce fear in your heart. I I hope that when you think of Jesus coming, that it doesn't produce fear in your heart. It shouldn't. Not if you're in Christ. It should produce joy and excitement and hope. And it should create urgency to share the good news of the gospel. Friends, we live in the last hour. He says, children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. When we hear that word Antichrist, we have a lot of baggage 
uh, that we've gathered up that comes along with that word, right? I'm sure when, when we even read that word earlier, when we read the text for the first time, there was ideas, there was thoughts that came through your head, especially if you've been in church a long time, about what Antichrist is and, and what that means uh, today. And so we're not going to go in detail about... John uses this word in two ways. He uses it in a singular form first and then in, in a plural term second. And we're going to be more concerned about the second than we are the first. But we do know that there is a... A, a, a antichrist coming one day who will come up and, and will be um, empowered by Satan and, and he will come up as a leader of the nations that he will lead away uh, many people who have claimed to be Christians. We know that the, he'll unite the world in peace before uh, uh, leading it into war. We know that this person uh, is will... Uh, come with earthly power, with earthly influence, and even claim Christ's authority. But we know that ultimately that he will be defeated by Christ when Christ comes to rule and reign on the earth. So there is an Antichrist coming, but John says that there is an anti a spirit of Antichrist that is already here. He says... As you have heard, Antichrist is coming, and so now many Antichrists have already come. And so what he's talking about is the false teachers of this day, people who had risen up in the church and claimed the name of Jesus, but they were actually preaching a false gospel. They had infiltrated the church and they were trying to lead believers away from the true gospel to believe something different. So the, the, the group of false teachers in this day were known as the Gnostics. And the word Gnostic, it means knowledge or special knowledge. And so these people claim to have a, a special knowledge of God, a secret knowledge of God. It was all about secrets. And so uh, you should be aware of people, uh, especially who claim the name of Jesus, who just have a lot of secrets that just like the, 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 that, that everything about the, the, their faith, everything about you, you have to be on the inside, you have to be in the in group, you have to have this secret knowledge that only a select few people have. As born-again believers, we know that, that the knowledge of the gospel is not just for a, a select few to get in on the secret. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for everyone. All people at all times get to know the good news of the gospel. There's not a secret knowledge that <coughs> only a few people have. The good news is for everyone who will receive it. So they, uh, they, they claim to have this secret knowledge of God. They also believed that all matter, all material things were bad and evil and that all spiritual things were good. And so because they believed that all matter was bad, they didn't believe that God could come in the flesh. If God is good and matter is bad, they didn't believe that God could come in the flesh. And so they didn't believe that Jesus was actually a man. They believed that he just appeared to have a body, but he was actually just a spirit. <coughs> this is problem problematic because if Jesus didn't come in the flesh, he couldn't make a full and final sacrifice for sin. And so it doesn't sound like a big deal when you first hear it, but when you realize the implications of that for the gospel, that, that if Jesus didn't come in the flesh, there was no sacrifice. If there was no sacrifice, there is no gospel. And so that's the way false teachings work. They don't sound that bad from the outside, but when you realize the full weight of the implications of those dangerous teachings, you lose the gospel. And so Gnosticism is not as influential today as it was then, but um, 
There is many, there are many false teachers in America today. There is a lot of of not just bad doctrine, but heretical doctrine in the church in America today. We as believers ought to be careful who we listen to. Can I tell you something? Just because somebody has a suit and a pulpit and a stage and they claim the name of Jesus, it doesn't mean that they're teaching good doctrine. It doesn't mean that they're teaching the right. There, there are people who, who love Jesus who are being led away by false teachers today. There's many people uh, in America that, that Paul would say are teaching the doctrines of demons. So just because someone stands in a pulpit and preaches doesn't mean they're from God. And you should test every single person who stands in the pulpit against Scripture. Just don't believe it because I told you. Believe it because this book says it. I could be wrong. Did you hear me? I could be wrong. But but this book is not. And so don't just believe it because somebody standing in the pulpit with a microphone said it and told you to believe it, but believe it because the Word of God proves it. There's false gospels going around and, and many people say, well, they're still preaching Jesus. Not really. Not really. Many people say, well, you need to stay away from doctrine because doctrines divide. Have you heard that? Just, just stay away from doctrines because doctrines divide. Let's just worry about love and, and grace. But friend, I want you to realize today <coughs> that we need to be a people who know doctrines because doctrines can be the difference between a, a, a person's eternal destination. Just because a person claims the name of Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that they believe what's necessary to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's some false teachings, I'll talk about two of them briefly, that are going around that are so dangerous. The first is a works-based salvation gospel. There's people who, who believe right here in our county, people that we're friends with, people that we work with, who go to churches that believe that, that, that you should trust in your own good works to get you into heaven. That, that somehow Jesus is the, 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 the way in to eternal life, but it's your good works that sustain you, that keep you in, and that if you've not done enough good and you've not shunned enough bad that you're going... Going to hell. Friend, I want you to know that if you die trusting in your own good works, trusting in anything you've done, you will not see heaven. And many of these people are good people. People that are good to be around even. But because they don't believe by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, that that's how salvation comes, they, they will not see heaven. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. That is a that is a bedrock of our faith that we've not done anything to earn our salvation. But it's by grace alone. And so we want to be careful when we hear that te- teaching that 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 works get you in or works get you out, that we step back and say, no, that's not right. That is not the gospel. The second dangerous teaching, there's many of these going around, but but the second dangerous, dangerous teaching is, is the false gospel of the prosperity gospel. This gospel says that God's plan for your life is that you would be healthy, wealthy, and comfortable. And that all you have to do if you get sick is to believe enough and you'll be healed. God's ultimate purpose for your life is for you to be happy. And it sounds good from the outside, but I want you to know that that, that there are many people 
even in this room who are faithful to God, who, who have faith to move mountains, but they're not healed because God's using that thing in their life to produce something in them. Many times we tell people, well, if you just have enough faith, God will heal you. That's not always true. It's not always true. I've seen people who love God, who are more faithful to God than I am, who have more faith than I have, and I've seen them die. I've seen them suffer. And it's not because they didn't have enough faith, but that was God's will that they would go through that, not because God wants them to suffer, but because God was using that thing to produce something in them. God allows pain and suffering and sickness in our life because He is using it for our good and His glory. God's will is not that you, that, that, that you would always be healthy, wealthy, and comfortable. God uses hard times in our life to, to, to do something in us, to make us draw close to Him. That's the ultimate goal of our lives is that we would draw near to God, not that we would be comfortable. God's more concerned about your closeness than your comfort. And so if, if God has to use sickness to draw you close, He will because that's what's most important. That's what's most important. And so it, th this prosperity gospel that if you name it and claim it, you'll have it, is dangerous. It's dangerous. I want to make sure that you understand what I'm saying this morning. I believe 100% that God still heals people. And I believe 100%. Scripture commands us to pray for the sick so that they might be healed. And so if you're sick this morning, I will pray with you. And I will believe with you. And we'll just hold on to each other. And we'll hold on to God. And we'll believe to the very last second that God will heal you. But if He doesn't, I'll still comfort you and say God still loves you. And he's still good, and he's going to use this thing for your good and his glory. So does God still heal people? Yes, he does. But does God heal everyone? No. He doesn't. Why? We don't know. I can't tell you why God heals some and he doesn't heal others. But I do know that he's still good. He's still good. And He's got good purposes in our life. Not just for health and wealth, but for joy and contentment. For grace and forgiveness. And for us to draw close to Him. Be careful of false teachers. Be careful of false teachers. Test every spirit. Don't just believe people because they stand in a pulpit. John says that there, have, that there is Antichrist coming, but there has already been Antichrists who have come. Those are the false teachers. And he says because of this, we know that it is the last hour. We can see that because of these false teachings, these people who claim the name of Jesus but who are leading people astray, we know it is the last hour. Then he says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. <coughs> but they went out that it might become plain that they all that they all are not of us. People had been led away by these teachers. People had left the church, the churches that these uh, this letter was written to. And he said, "I want you to know that they went out from us, but they went out from us because they were never of us." See, the true test uh, of a genuine faith is is endurance. That here, here's what I mean by that. 
a, a person who, who trusts Jesus as their, as their Savior, makes Him Lord of their life, will still believe that at the end of their life. The, the, the true test of, of genuine faith is endurance, that, that, that it's a faith that holds up to the test of time. And so John says, People went out from us. People left this church. People went after false teachers. People went out from us. But the reason they went out from us is because they were never of us. This happened so that it could be plain that that not everybody who, who claims to be a part is a part. Not everybody who claims the name of Jesus is of Jesus. And then he says... But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. So he says, you have the Holy Spirit. You've been given this gift. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and He is to lead us into all truth. (coughs) John says, you all have knowledge that... He's pushing back against the Gnostic teaching that only a few people had knowledge. He says, no, because the Holy Spirit lives in you, you have the knowledge. You've been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. And so he says the Antichrist is anyone who who denies Jesus Christ. That Jesus is who he says he is. That Jesus is who this book reveals him to be. When you you start messing with Jesus, you you no longer have the Father. (coughs) Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. And so people who deny Jesus, well, and and here's what I mean by that. If you ask anybody if they love Jesus, they'll say yes. Go up to town and country later today and ask anybody what they think about Jesus and they'll think, They'll say, well, I think he was a pretty good guy. And I, you know, I'm a Christian because that one time I went to church and my grandma was a pretty good person. And so, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? All your neighbors say, yeah, I think Jesus was a good guy. Yeah, I think he was good. Even, even other religions, Islam believes that, that, that Jesus was a good teacher. Hinduism believes that he's one of many ways to God. And so there's many people who who believe in Jesus. <coughs> but when you begin to ask people, do you believe that Jesus is the only way to God? Do you believe that Jesus should be Lord of your life, controller of everything that happens in your life? Then people begin to say, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know if he's the only way. I, 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 don't, I don't know if he, if he really was God in the flesh. And I don't know if he really resurrected. I think he was a good moral teacher. And, and I try to do unto others as they do unto me. But I don't know about, I don't know about that Lord stuff. If you deny the Son, then you don't have the Father. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. I'm reading through Mere Christianity right now and C.S. Lewis says that you have three options when it comes to Jesus. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He's either, either the biggest fraud that's ever come out. He's either... A lunatic, he was crazy, who would claim to be God unless they were crazy or really God? Or he is Lord, and you don't have any other options than those three. If Jesus is who he said he is, if he is God, then we must submit to him as Lord of our lives. 
If he is who he says he is, we have no option but to bend a knee. Say, yes, you, you have control of our life. You are my everything, but if he's not who he says he is, he's a lunatic or a liar. But no one who denies the Son has the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. That's good news. No one who... Hold on, I skipped. Here we go. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has made to us eternal life. So what had they heard from the beginning? They had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus had came and that He lived the perfect life. That He made a perfect sacrifice for sin. That He died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and on three days He rose again victorious over sin, death, and hell. That's what they had heard from the beginning. And so he says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. What does that word abide mean? It means to make your home in. And so John says, let the gospel make its home in your life. And you make your home in Jesus Christ. Now think about that. I'm not asking you this morning, do you believe the gospel? I believe most of you do. But has the gospel made its home in your life? He says... Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. And if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, <coughs> then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise that He made to us eternal life. When, we, when the gospel has its home in our heart, we have eternal life. We have eternal life. He says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you have received from him abides in you. The, the Holy Spirit abides in us. The third part of the Trinity has made his home in us. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you, about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is taught you, abide in Him. John says, the Holy Spirit has moved into you. The one who was behind the writing of this book. We believe that, that, that this book is inspired by God, right? Breathed by the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. The one who wrote the book lives in you. The one who wrote the book lives in you. Tell me again why you can't understand Scripture. The one who wrote the book lives in you. If you'll read the book, he'll open the eyes of your heart. He'll teach you. Now, is John saying we don't need to have Bible teachers and we don't need sermons and we don't need Bible studies? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying the one who wrote the book lives in you. If you're a born-again believer, you have no excuse to say, I don't understand the book. If you'll ask God, he'll open the eyes of your heart that you can see what it means. The Holy Spirit lives in you and He will teach you. John says you have no need that any man should teach you. You have the one who wrote the book in you. And then he says, 
just as it has taught you, just as the Spirit has taught you, abide in Him. Make your home in Him. Make your home in Him. What would it look like for you this week to make your home in Him? Your home's where you're most comfortable, right? Your home's where you spend the majority of your time. Your home, at least for me, is the place that I always look forward to going. What if our home was in His presence? It's a place I'm always looking forward to going. His presence. A place I most want to be. His presence. My prayer for you and for I this week is that we would learn to make our home in Him. To make our home in the gospel. That we would just be captivated by the gospel. That we would rest in the gospel. Home is a place of rest, right? May we rest in His presence. May we rest in the good news of the gospel. I hope that when our minds are idle this week, that they'll go to Him. That when we don't have anything else to be thinking about, our mind just wanders back to the presence of God and to the good news of what He's done for us. How would our life look different this week if we made our home in Him? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you are and all that you've done for us. God, we, uh, we've heard your word and God, we thank you for it. God, we thank you that you've given us this book, your word, and God, even more than that, we thank you that you have given us the one who wrote the book to live in us, live with us, live through us. Now, Lord, we ask that you would guard our hearts against false teachers that would lead us astray. Lord, we ask that you would help us to live with a sense of urgency in our heart, realizing that we are in the last hour, and that you are soon coming. Lord, help us to abide in you. Help us to make our home in you. Holy Spirit, I just ask right now that in the heart of every believer in this room, God, that you would just show us what that looks like. What does it mean for us to make our home in you this week? What, what, what does that look like? How can we do that? Show us right now in our hearts. Lord, help us to make our homes in you. And I pray that even now and, and this week, that we would be captivated by you. <laughs> and that when our mind wanders, that our, our mind would just wander back to the cross and back to what you've done. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. May we abide in that. In Jesus' name, amen.